Hello guys, and it is finally here, the long-awaited Anatomy of an 8088 PC. Now, for you guys that have been following uh, my blog and my channel for a while, you know I do this series called Anatomy of, where I look at building a computer for a certain era, and uh, what I feel is maybe the best parts of it. Usually it ends up on the high end, uh, you know, so the, the later end of the era to get kind of the best, most mature parts for a build. But basically, let's say you want to make a... Uh, build a 386 build. So we go over what I think is probably the best uh, parts to go into making that build. I try to do a balance of compatibility, power, and aesthetics. Uh, kind of like designing a tank with firepower, armor, and mobility. You want to, the best uh, designs usually have a good balance of those. Of course, sometimes we do make compromises, and uh, there is one in this machine we will go over uh, between the three, but yeah, very interesting. So we started this out with a a uh, fast DOS machine, and we talked about uh, building a fast DOS machine on an early Pentium. We talked about the Windows 3.1 era. Uh, we talked about the 486, the 386, and the last one I did was Anatomy of a 286 PC, and that was quite a while ago. And this one's taking me, well, taken me a long time to put together, uh, just because sourcing some of the parts is difficult. Um, got, trying to find stuff at a reasonable rate. Uh, those 8-bit uh, cards uh, aren't that common anymore. So uh, we're going to go over this machine. We're going to go over what I think makes the best uh, sort of machine if you want to make an 8088 build. Uh, this is from the early days of retro computing. We're talking about the early 80s here. Um, so if you want to come along for that ride, uh, it's going to be an interesting one. So we're going to talk about the machine. We're going to talk about maybe the part, things you want to look for. Um, the kind of expansion cards maybe you want. We're going to look at a couple cards that you don't need, but we have anyways. And I'm um, going to show you some glorious CGA games, and then we're going to wrap it up and what I think about this machine. Alright, so the 8088, it's not a super popular build that has a lot to do with games. And I think, I'll talk about this again when the video is concluding, but when people think about, you know, the golden age of DOS, they were like, I want to make a retro computer to play retro games. They're usually thinking about Doom, uh, Duke Nukem 3D, uh, stuff like that. Eye of the Beholder, uh, Monkey, uh, Secret of Monkey Island, stuff like that. Uh, Wing Commander. And those games really encompass, those are more of like the 46, 386 era. You've got to remember... Uh, the early computers of the early 80s, the 8088, 8086, even somewhat the 286-based machines, really weren't for games. You didn't make a gaming computer in 1981 or 82, the early 80s in general. These were built for office use. These were built for utility. Um, I had a guy, once I read in a forum, someone wanted to make an 8088 gaming PC, and uh, I, I just thought it was a funny quote. It says, you, you don't buy like an IBM 5150, um, you know, for games. It's for if you want to pretend you're an office worker in like 1982 or something. And, um, I mean, it's the truth. The, the games uh, are really not what people think of when they want that classic golden era of DOS. These are sort of arcadey, uh, very short pick-up-and-play, simple games. Now, you do have some notable RPGs that have a little bit more meat to them, sometimes a lot more meat to them. You have the early Ultimas, the Wizardries and whatnot, but um, other than, like, RPGs and some simulations, uh, it's really the games on these kind of machines, the mach games that these kind of machines can play, uh, really don't appeal to the masses as much as games from, like, a 386 or a 486 would. So you really need to consider that when making an 8088 build. It's not really something I'd recommend to most people just getting into these, you know, retro gaming, because I don't think it really offers uh, what most people are looking for. And it is a lot, it's limited, a lot power-wise, really. You can really beef these things up, uh, so they will play some of those later games, but when you look at the cost and the effort, it's kind of like, why would you do that? You may as well just buy or build an 8088 or a 46 build. Why would you go through the effort of beefing up uh, an 8088 machine that's really not going to cut the mustard uh, most of the time. And parts, <laughs> uh, if, if you think finding parts like 16-bit ISA stuff for a 386 or a 486 is difficult or expensive, uh, uh, 
yeah, wait till you start getting into like an 8088 stuff. Uh, it's not so much, a, well, yeah, it is. It, it, it can be expensive, <laughs> but it, it's also hard to come across, especially um, in the wild. If you're, if you're building one of these machines, uh, if you want some of the more exotic parts, you're probably going to have to hit up eBay. Um, whereas for maybe a 46, I, I will come across stuff. Uh, you know, at thrift stores every once in a while, but these machines, um, not so much. Um, the one thing I like to point out, when I do these anatomy ofs, I usually go with like a stock, uh, generic case and build. This one actually is, it's a Showtronics Turbojet 8810. Now, Showtronics was a local company. Everyone back in the day, uh, was building their own sort of computers, but this thing pretty much uses all off-the-shelf parts, so it's nothing you couldn't just put together yourself. Uh, the only thing different is a little bit of, like the branding, little stickers, and like the BIOS comes up as like Showtronics, but yeah, they were a local company uh, around here in Phoenix that put these things together, so yeah, but like I said, it's all kind of off-the-shelf parts, so uh, we'll let it slide there. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna move this monitor out of the way. We'll get to talking about it a little bit more later. This, this is a Tandy monitor and um, actually now that we're talking about Tandy real quick before I get into this more, I would say the perfect machine for an 8088 build would be a Tandy 1000 uh, for that Tandy sound and graphics. Uh, so, but for the sake of this video, we're going to ignore that. So uh, we're, we're not going to talk about the, we're not going to consider the Tandy, although I would say something like a Tandy 1000 SX would be the best 8088 sort of machine if you wanted to build one uh, just for the reasons of the Tandy sound and graphics. A lot of games supported them. But we're for the sake of this video, we're not going to talk about Tandy 1000. We're, we're not going to consider it. But uh, I'm using a Tandy 1000 monitor. This is a CM5. I would love to find a CM11, uh, but I have not come across one yet. Um, you can use any kind of CGA monitor, but uh, you do want a CGA monitor for these builds, even though you don't necessarily need one. But we'll get to that when I talk about the graphics card. So I'm going to move this out of the way, and then we are going to talk about the machine itself here. All right, so here we are with our machine. Um, as you can see, this case is really yellowed. <laughs> I'm sure this was more of a, a gray back in the day rather than this gross sort of yellow. Uh, you could use things like Retrobrite uh, to get more of the original color back, but I just haven't really bothered. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me too much. Um, but yeah, this is, I like this case. I found this case randomly uh, at a swap meet, uh, this whole machine actually, which was pretty neat. But let's, uh, let's go over this case real quick. It's not too different from what you'd find in other eras. We have the little key lock here. Uh, we have LEDs for hard drive activity and for power. We have this really awesome turbo switch, which for once actually does what it says as far as turbo, it accelerates the CPU. We'll talk about that when we get to the CPU. And this nice reset switch. Um, now over here we have the drives. You'll notice there's only two drive bays here, at least that we can access externally. So it's two five and a quarter bays. Not what you're, th the usual here. We. The drives in here, the top drive here, this is not a 1.5 a megabyte. On these machines, for the most part, they are not going to support high density drives. There are ways that you can have them support high density drives. Uh, there are 8-bit controllers, floppy controllers, that will work with high density drives. They're very rare and expensive. I believe there's also some software solutions that you can use, uh, though I'm not quite sure how the compatibility on those are. And um, you can always use a parallel port device, uh, kind of like this. This is a CD drive one. There are high def or high definition, high density uh, floppy drives that you can hook up parallel port. But for the most part, you are going to be working with low density uh, floppy drives, which actually the games and software on these machines is so small. The files are so small. It's it's really not a problem. So. Uh, what we have here, this is a 360K floppy drive, not 1.2 megabytes. And down here we have a 720K uh, floppy drive, not a 1.44. So just keep that in mind. I believe you can use high density drives. I know it for sure with the uh, 1.44 megabyte drives, you can put them in these machines and they'll act just like 720 uh, kilobyte drives. And I believe the same is true for the 1.2 megabyte high density drives. I believe 
if you put them in these machines with the low density controller they will act like 360 K drives but I'm not 100% sure on that uh, one tip though is when you're putting these machines together you definitely want each of these drives if you can uh, the, the 720 kilobyte drive just makes life a lot easier uh, you can use like a Windows machine and you can put stuff on a floppy disk and then you can transfer it uh, using the 720 kilobyte and most of the programs from this era will fit very comfortably on a 720 kilobyte uh, floppy drive another tip is when you have the 360 uh, five and a quarter inch drive you want to make that the A drive um, I know usually you want to have this the bigger drive at least in my later machines I always make the A drive you know the 1.4 or the three and a half inch drive but when you're dealing with this era there were a lot of booter games and um, those were games that don't need an operating system so you just put the disc in and when you start up the game it will uh, boot from the disc and play the game and a lot of those come on the 360 kilobyte disks and some of them look specifically for the A drive and uh, it's very hard if not impossible to you know get them to uh, auto boot off a B drive at least in my experience so just save yourself a lot of hassle and make your A drive the 360 K drive so I will turn this and we'll take a quick look at the back first on the side of course here is most likely your power button is going to be a big satisfying switch. Uh, so usually on these old builds, on these 8088 type computers, it's usually going to be a big old switch on the side. Alright, so let's turn around and look at the back. Alright, so with these old power supplies, something I kind of like, I like how it has the dual the pass through so you can actually plug the monitor into and then you turn one on and it, both of them. It just it saves some space on the power strips. I really like that. Keep in mind a lot of the, the power supplies in these older machines they tend to be lower wattage uh, so you don't want to stress them too much. Just keep that in mind. Over here we have the keyboard connector. It looks very standard. It looks like an AT connector. Uh, it is not. So you want to keep that in mind too with most of these 8088 machines. It looks like AT but it is not. It's actually its own thing for PC XT class computers. Now technically this is an XT class computer. So the early computers they were either PC or XT class and they're mostly the same. A little bit of differences. Usually what that the biggest difference I think is with the XT it has more uh, ISA slots that you can use. Um, and then there's AT and that was completely different. So with these 8088 machines for the most part we're talking about PC uh, XT class machines and uh, like I was showing just a second ago uh, that means the protocol or how the keyboard connections is uh, it's electronically different and a lot of these old keyboards actually have a switch uh, see this one says AT and then PC XT and for this machine uh, we want it on PC XT not AT so just keep that in mind uh, when you're looking for keyboards you want one that supports PC XT, uh, not AT, or one like this that has a nice little convenient switch. All right, so going on, we don't see too much here. Um, we see some I/O connections. Another card here that may look a little familiar. Uh, that's for the video. This is for a composite. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then we have a sound card here. So, but we'll talk about all that in a minute. So let's open this thing up. Let's finally take a look inside. All right, so here is with the case off. Uh, it's nice. Uh, this machine's always been was very clean inside. I really liked it. Uh, even when I first got it, it was very clean, well taken care of. Um, now, right off the bat, you're going to probably notice something uh, not quite era correct, and uh, we're going to talk about that and the reasons for that when we get to the hard drive controller. I'll discuss that. So. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take out the cards and we're going to go over them uh, one at a time, take a quick look at the motherboard, and then I think we'll do some footage of this thing in action. Alright, so here is our motherboard laid bare. We have our 8-bit ISA slots, that's all we have. We have 8 here. I believe up on a PC class machine there's only 5, so we have 8, so this is an XT class machine. Here is our RAM. In On the board here we have our full uh, one megabyte but 640 kilobytes uh, of conventional memory 
Now that isn't always the case. Most of these machines will come with a full 640 or at least the ability to expand to 640, uh, but that's not always the case. Like early IBM machines, uh, I believe they only came with like 64K of memory and you could uh, you could expand it, but you'd have to use uh, expansion cards. But a lot of the somewhat later boards, uh, you could expand it all on the motherboard. So that's, that's nice. Um, and you definitely want to look out for that. I would also recommend uh, looking for a turbo board. So that's a board that can do more than the standard 4.77 megahertz. So uh, if you have a game that maybe needs a little bit of a speed boost, you can hit your turbo button and uh, that will up your speed. Usually it's, uh, I forget the exact, but it's about 7 megahertz would be the speed bump. Although some have other higher speed settings, like this one can turbo to 10 megahertz. So let's look at the CPU and talk about a very critical uh, option you're going to want to consider. So here's our CPU right here. We have our 8088 and we have our math coprocessor, the 8081. So let's talk about the math coprocessor uh, first really quick. Um, this is something you don't really need. Um, not many games or applications take advantage of, this, advantage of this unless you're planning to CAD on an 8088 machine or something like that. Um, some games like SimCity do take advantage of that, but it's not really necessary. Um, I just want it because I kind of want to you know, go all out and fill up this machine, and I don't like empty sockets, uh, but you don't really need one. Um, so here is your 8088. Um, usually they're from Intel or even AMD. Uh, this one is from Fujitsu, uh, but they all operate exactly the same. Now when you're building an 8088 machine, there's something you really want to consider as far as CPUs go, and that is, do I want to upgrade to an NEC V20? Um, this machine I have kept stock. I did not upgrade to an NEC V20 um, because I just wanted to go a little bit more in the way of compatibility with this machine, but generally, it's a generally recommended upgrade. Now, the NEC V20, I think we briefly talked about it in some of my other videos, but that's a drop-in pin-compatible replacement for the 8088. Uh, it runs a little bit more efficient and uh, it's just faster. So even at 4.77 megahertz, it's going to run a little bit faster. And there are a few games that you can kind of feel the speed bump and it kind of throws it off a little bit, but generally it's okay. Uh, like I said, I really just wanted to go with that strict, completely, you know, stock standard 4.77 megahertz CGA 100% compatibility. Uh, but in general, I would recommend the V20, especially if you only have a few uh, retro computers and you want to add a little bit of power so you could play, help you play a little bit maybe of later games. Uh, I would recommend one. Uh, there's something like, they're like 99% compatible. I think the only game that just won't run with one is uh, lo like a certain version of Load Runner. I think like the Champion Edition of Load Runner uh, won't work with an NEC V20, but generally everything else will. So it's generally a recommended upgrade. Uh, but like I said, I just went all out uh, with compatibility, so I just went with the stock 8088. And another thing I want to mention about the uh, 8088, and if you do upgrade to an NEC V20, uh, that does allow things for, say, uh, using a zip drive, whereas on a regular 8088 you actually can't use a zip drive, you need at least an NEC V20 uh, upgrade or better to use a zip drive. The web blog Nerdly Pleasures, which is a site I frequently visit, also has a small list of games that have issues when not run on a true uh, 4.77 MHz 8088, and a couple that have CGA card issues that need a CGA card, so that site is worth checking out. Uh, I will link it in the description. And another quick note or addendum on the uh, CPU. Uh, I also almost forgot to mention there are accelerators available for these. A lot of uh, 8088 to 286 type accelerators, like the Tiny Turbo is the first one that comes to mind. And a lot of these accelerators let you to put the original 8088 and the 286 on the accelerator so you keep that compatibility and if you need that little extra bump of speed you know you hit a button combination or flip a switch and that activates the 286 uh, obviously it's not going to be as fast as a true 286 since you're still limited by the architecture of this uh, board but it does give you a nice boost of speed now is it worth it um, I don't know those they, they tend to be rare they tend to be pretty pricey on places like eBay uh, so you may be able to buy a, like a complete 
3D6 or 2D6 system for the same amount of money, but it depends on your needs. It gives you a little bit more range of uh, games that you can play comfortably on this machine with an accelerator. These boards used to not be too rare. I mean, there are a lot of 8088 boards out there. I, I used to find these at Goodwill. Um, they have become rarer lately, but you can still find them if you're lucky. Like I said, mine, I don't know if you can see it, but right here it says 10 megahertz turbo board. So you want to look for like markings like that, but um, usually they'll have switches somewhere. You generally want to know what these do. Uh, usually these let you set up like if you're using CGA or a monochrome or things like that. So you usually, if you find a board, you usually want to figure out what these things uh, do. But other than that, I, as I said, there's really nothing built into the board. It's just the board and the you know things to make it work. You got your RAM and you've got your uh, CPU, your math coprocessor, and your slots. But there's there's like no I/O controller built in these things at all. So you do need all those expansion cards. And also there there is this big space here. Um, like I said, those MFM drives are generally pretty big, and a lot of them are full height. And um, that's what this little spot's for. I don't know. If I'm feeling I want to be a little more period correct, I might replace this compact flash card with at least like an IDE drive, uh, just so I get that hard drive sound. But I, to be honest, I have been happy with this card. And, you know, it's DOS. There's not a lot of like read-writes going on constantly, like maybe Windows. So I think it, these cards hold up a lot better in a DOS environment than a Windows environment. So it doesn't make me so paranoid um, in that sense. But yeah, uh, the power supply again real quick. This is a model PIP151. Uh, this is 150 watts. Uh, a lot of them were, you know, like in the 65 watt range. Well, at least the early ones. So 151, that, that's pretty decent. First, we're going to look at what I would think are cards that are very essential if you are going to put together an 8088 build. Um, and the first thing we're going to talk about is the hard drive and a hard drive controller because these machines do not have anything built into the motherboard. At least on very rare occasions they might, uh, certain OEM boards, but general generic boards you come across are going to have absolutely nothing built into the motherboard. So you're going to need controller cards for just about everything. And I really think one of the most convenient things you can have in any computer is a hard drive. So you're going to want uh, something like this. You're going to want a hard drive controller. Um, now this right here is a Silicon Valley computer controller, IDE controller from uh, 1991. 8-bit IDE controllers, at least from the time period, are pretty hard to come by. You may have seen this one before. I think I used to have this in the Epson machine until I transferred it into this machine. And uh, I love this card. Uh, it recognizes and works with just about every IDE hard drive I throw at it. So this is a really nice card. Of course, there are more modern cards you can use too, uh, like the uh, XT IDE cards. They run about sixty or hundred dollars, which is probably cheaper than what these authentic authentic cards go for, probably on eBay. They're e probably easier to find too. I've used those before, and they work just fine. Uh, that's a very good solution that I would recommend, and they work with a variety of compact flash. Uh, I believe even SD and IDE uh, hard drives uh, just like this and they go for like I think I said around 60 to 100 cheaper if you can solder and you can build uh, one yourself but yeah I definitely recommend a hard drive controller now if you want to go really period correct there are MFM controllers. Uh, the hard drives back then were generally MFM I think the RLL was another one. Um, I'll put a picture up on the video, if I can, uh, of an R, uh, MFM drive. And those are the really big uh, hard drives. They're usually pretty small in capacity. They're getting very hard to find. Uh, I wish I had one. I have a couple, but I don't have one easily available to show you guys right now. But the controller cards for those, though, are pretty cheap on eBay, last I checked. And I don't recommend using those unless you really want to go period correct. The controller cards might not be too expensive, but the drives themselves working tend to be pretty pricey. Uh, the capacity is usually pretty small in size. They're slow. They eat a lot of power. And uh, I just don't recommend those drives uh, at all unless you really want to go for something period authentic, period correct. 
And um, I completely understand if you want to go that route for something completely period correct. That's what you'd want to do. But uh, I just don't find them. I mean, they're going on, what, like 30 years old right now. And I just, the reliability and the power strain, I just don't trust, you know, 20, 30 plus hours of wizardry. Uh, you know, on one of those drives, especially if I'm if I'm playing hardcore like RPGs where I'm devoting lots and lots of hours on an authentic machine, you don't necessarily want one of those old drives that may be unreliable. Now, as you've seen earlier, I went with a more modern solution. I went with a compact flash card, which so far has worked great for this machine. I was doing a little experimenting. It's usually not my style. Uh, usually I would just pop in an IDE drive, uh, even just for that, you know, sound of that drive going, since the compact flash card is completely silent. So I think using an IDE card, well, an IDE controller card and an IDE hard drive on one of these 808 machines, it's a good compromise between completely period correct and, you know, what I did, which was to just use a compact flash card, or if you want to use some kind of SSD. I don't think it would have been out of the question to find an IDE controller and an IDE hard drive uh, in an 8088 machine back in the day, uh, especially in like maybe the late 80s. They were still making these machines as like budget machines. Maybe in an office, still going to be, you know, maybe they don't want to upgrade their machines. Uh, but they do want to put in a better hard drive or a bigger hard drive. So would, I don't think it would have been out of the question to find these IDE drives in a late 80s 808 machine. But of course something like a compact flash drive, um, no. Another benefit of the compact flash drive is they did come in 32 megabytes, which is the, since we're using an older version of DOS on this machine, I believe it's version 3.3, uh, we do have a size limit of 32 megabytes. And uh, using a 20 or 40 or 80 gigabyte IDE drive on this machine would be a massive waste of space. So just using a 32 megabyte compact flash drive, I don't feel so bad. Uh, of course, you can use smaller capacity IDE drives. They're not horribly hard to find. So there is that. All right, so uh, now we've talked about IDE controller or a hard drive controller in general. Whether you go with MFM or something like an IDE controller, uh, I definitely recommend you put in some kind of hard drive and a hard drive controller in your 8088 build. All right, so let's move on to the next card. So the next kind of card I would recommend getting is some kind of I.O. controller. So you have some kind of ports that you can connect with uh, external devices. And this is going to be, these are really cheap and easy to find. Uh, I'm just using a generic Winbond device here. Now if you'll notice this is indeed a 16-bit ISA card, but you'll notice a lot of these will work uh, on 8-bit in an 8-bit mode uh, like this one will. And all this one adds, it's very simple, it just adds a serial and a parallel port. Uh, which can be very useful. If you want to hook up a mouse, you can use the serial port or any kind of like printer or like I showed earlier, if you want to hook up like a parallel port floppy drive uh, or a parallel port CD-ROM drive or something like that, uh, you really want a card like this. So uh, this is another card that I would definitely recommend if you're doing an 8088 build. Usually I recommend adding a CD-ROM drive. Uh, it's just very convenient on a lot of these machines, um, but on an 8088, uh, I really don't find a CD drive uh, necessary. The games are like are so small; um, they easily fit on a floppy. Uh, they didn't release a lot of them in like compilations or on CD because they're just so small, and they're really just pick up and play games for the most part. Like I said, some of the bigger RPGs got re-releases on CDs, but I just I don't think a CD-ROM drive is really a must-have add-on uh, for one of these. But as I said earlier. Uh, you can use something like a like these backpack drives, uh, which will give you uh, an external CD-ROM drive that you can hook up to these 8088 machines. All right, so of course we're going to need a video card. Video card is going to be an essential component uh, to your 8088 build. Um, although, in my opinion, you're going to want a specific kind of card, and that would be a CGA card. Um, so one of the main reasons you would want an 8080 build is because there are a number of games that really demand two things. They demand an 8088 processor running at 4.77 megahertz, and they demand CGA. Um, now, there is VGA and EGA, which is backwards compatible with CGA for the most part, but not, not completely true. 
some reasons you would want a true CGA card uh, running on a CGA monitor other than period correctness is there are some incompatibilities uh, with later cards when you're running CGA software. Now I'm not going to go too much into CGA and how it works. There's uh, several videos online if you want to look about CGA and the standard specifically. Um, specifically a video from 8-Bit Guy who did a pretty good uh, video on uh, CGA and how it works. I will, uh, if I remember, I will link that video in the description. So if you want to look at the ins and outs of CGA itself, check out that video or other videos on YouTube. Uh, but I will say that you, if you're making, if you're going through the trouble of making an 8088 build, uh, I think you really should go with uh, true CGA. Um, now CGA, of course, is pretty limited. It usually uses a palette of four colors, although there's certain tricks you can do uh, or that certain software uses to get more of those. Um, you also want a card that has some kind of composite output. Now my monitor doesn't have a composite input on it, but some do, and um, it's a really handy feature with games that do support composite. Uh, you could get a lot more colors from it, almost like uh, EGA, although not quite. Like I said, if uh, check out that video by 8-Bit Guy pretty good and uh, he goes over all of that. Now the card I'm using here is an ATI Small Wonder. This is version 2. These are these are pretty good cards. Uh, they support CGA. Uh, they also support like Hercules Graphics Standard which is kind of like a, a monochrome version of CGA and um, some other kind of obscure standards. Uh, so I would really recommend a card like this. Uh, you don't really need anything super special for a CGA card, but uh, this card has never steered me wrong. Now, yeah, that is a little bit weird how I have the um, composite dongle on here, but some cards just have a connector like right on them, and you don't need to have this weird little dongle. Uh, so, some other reasons why you'd want a CGA card when you can, they do make a number of VGA cards that are compatible with 8-bit slots, uh, specifically some of the Trident cards, the 8900 series cards, uh, they work in 8-bit slots and they give you a VGA connector and VGA so you could play your VGA, EGA and CGA games on them in theory uh, but there are incompatibilities and i um, talk about that in a second here. So I've never come across any of these so-called incompatibilities. Everyone always would talk about them on the forums but in my use of CGA uh, on later machines I never came across an issue running VGA cards with CGA games. Uh, but I did ask some smart people over at the Vintage Computer Forums, and they did give me some instances where there were incompatibilities. So, some of the games, first of all, that were reported to have issues, unless you were using a true CGA card, was uh, Microsoft's Flight Simulator 2. Gave sort of a double screen issue. The game Starquake had positional issues and palette issues, at least when using a mock, uh, ATA Mach 32 VGA card, which makes sense. I've heard that card has some... Uh, incompatibilities. Uh, pretty much any game from Windmill Software will have issues since they use um, CGA register. I, I'm not, again, the technical side I am weak, but there is something CGA register compatible. You'll see that on some VGA cards. It will say 100% CGA register compatible. Um, a lot of the time that's not quite true. Uh, some VGA cards are more compatible than others, but apparently Windmill Software used a lot of this register compatible uh, stuff when they were making their games. So those games, for the most part, are not compatible with VGA cards. Uh, also, Freddy's Rescue Roundup apparently is has issues. Um, other more general things is a lot of people said that the colors were more vibrant when you were using a true uh, CGA card rather than a VGA card. And um, also things like colors were off when using a VGA card or you'd have palette issues where the game would default to the uh, the magenta cyan white black color scheme which is usually the most hideous of all CGA color schemes there are other more pleasant color uh, schemes and uh, apparently when you use a lot of VGA cards it will go to the default one and you won't be able to change it so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, Wizardry is a game that comes to mind that when you use a VGA card it defaults to that ugly color pattern but when you're using a real CGA card it's actually sort of pleasant and uh, I'll show you that when we play the game the more 
pleasant color mode that maybe some people aren't aware of. And uh, also keep in mind with CGA, it does kind of look like VGA, but it is different. It uses a different number of pins. Before we move on, I do want to touch on the subject of CGA monitors themselves, or RGB monitors, because uh, playing around with a lot of these games, these old CGA games, you would usually get an option, but it wouldn't say, like, uh, use a CGA monitor. It would usually be, like, an RGB. Do you have a, a composite t television, or do you have a monochrome monitor, or do you have an RGB monitor? So... You know, I've been doing this for a while now. I have a lot of old machines, but even I am really unsure sometimes. So I, I was thinking, is there a difference between a CGA monitor and an RGB monitor? Is, is there an EGA monitor? Is there a special CGA-only monitor? I knew there's monochrome-only monitors, but was there something I was missing? So uh, I asked the good people over at uh, the Vintage Computer Forum, and I did get some information on the subjects. Alright, so what I was told basically is a CGA monitor is a 15 kilohertz color monitor with a digital RGBI video input. So when you see a game and it asks if you have an RGB monitor, it's asking if you have a CGA monitor. They're basically the same thing. So to elaborate a little bit more on what that is, a 15 kilohertz uh, display means it supports a maximum resol resolution of 640 by 200, give or take. Um, and it also has an intensity pin, hence the RGBI. Um, it allows a total of 16 colors to be displayed, um, although most of the CGA graphics modes don't allow for these 16 colors to be displayed, it can. And thus, these monitors also support uh, things like Tandy, uh, the Tandy Video Standard, or EGA, at least in the 320 x 200 and 640 x 200 graphics modes. And it also supports other CGA video signals that you know, conform to the CGA standard, basically. And it also supports some other things like um, Amiga RGBI standard or the Commodore 128's 80 column mode. So it's it, RGBI monitor encompasses a lot of different graphics modes that it can accept, but basically, uh, to boil it down, uh, an RGBI monitor is a digital signal. Uh, it takes C it can accept CGA and all the sort of CGA-like modes and EGA, uh, at least in those lower sort of gra resolution graphics modes. So, uh, and then when we were talking about VGA, that's something different. I believe that's 30-something kilohertz, and that's an analog signal. It's not digital. Okay, so up there right now, this is a uh, just an image of the back of one of my uh, ATI VGA Wonder cards, and it actually has a connection for both uh, the... DE9, that's the connection used for CGA, and the DEHD15, which is the VGA connection. So uh, the DE9 connection is the same connector that um, cards that were like CGA cards or EGA cards would use, and it's different from the VGA. Although I want to say some early VGA monitors maybe also use DE9, but I don't quote me on that. Um, maybe they, maybe they you had. Both. I know there's something with early VGA monitors that some of them maybe could accept um, a 15 kilohertz signal. Maybe that's just it. But yeah, so I just wanted to touch on that uh, briefly since it is relevant to this build. Another quick thing to note about using a VGA card, although it will make it a lot easier with hooking up to a more modern uh, monitor, uh, a lot of the games that actually will take advantage of VGA won't run very well on an 8088. So in that sense, it's sort of wasted power anyways. But it does give you more options of monitors to hook up to since CGA monitors are getting a little bit rare. So now let's go over some more interesting cards, but cards you definitely don't need. Alright, so let's talk about sound cards. Um, <laughs> Now, sound card is really something that you don't need in an 8088. Uh, it's actually a lot more of a luxury, whereas I would definitely recommend some kind of sound card for a later system. Just an 8088, you're not going to find a lot of games that really take advantage of sound. Uh, remember, gaming wasn't a priority in the early days, and really, sound cards for computers didn't really start taking off till the late 80s. Uh, so all those games that run really well on an 8088-based machine uh, are not going to support sound. Now, if you are going to put a sound card in, I would recommend the earliest sound card, something like a Game Blaster or an AdLib. Uh, but the earliest sound card I have is this Sound Blaster, uh, this original Sound Blaster from 1990. 
Uh, it supports the Sound Blaster standard, and it also has the chips and it supports the CMS standard, the Creative Music System, which is another one of their earlier sound standards. So, um, this 1990, this would this isn't really period correct, but it is the earliest card I have. And again, this might not be out of question uh, being found in, you know, an 8088 machine still sitting around in uh, 1990, maybe someone's budget bill, something like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely don't recommend a sound card uh, unless you just have one sitting around. Uh, just because not a lot of games that run well on an 8088 uh, really support sound. Now there are exceptions, like Prince of Persia runs really well on an 8088, and it does support um, ad-lib. I think maybe even Sound Blaster as well. Um, and, you know, that it works well. So, I mean, if you've got it, uh, use it, I suppose, but it's definitely not a uh, necessity. But it does have its uses if you want to push the machine, play some later games. So, now we're going to look at some cards that really are even less useful. Yeah, so with this Sound Blaster, uh, it's pretty simple. You have your volume wheel, you have your joystick port. Um, that is a speaker out. I'm guessing that is an in, so um, they aren't labeled, though. All right, so before we continue, I thought it might be helpful to do a very crude explanation of memory and how it works on an 808 PC, because it's a little bit different. It's a little more limiting, um, so you have to deal with things like expansion, memory expansion cards, and things like that. Um, now, I, as I mentioned before, my experience on the technical side of things and technical details is pretty weak. Um, so, uh, any of you guys that probably know a lot more about this than the technical side, uh, if I mess up on anything, please let me know in the comments. This is, I think I have a decent grasp on this, but it's its really from a layman's point of view here, and uh, this is going to be really basic. And for you guys that are also just learning about this, make sure you scan the comments for corrections, uh, if anyone has any corrections and whatnot. Um, so, first we're going to talk about memory. Um, so I'll just draw a little memory block here. Um, now, the 8088 CPU is limited to one megabyte of memory and that's how mem much memory it can access and use now this is true up through all uh, computers uh, up until really the Windows era where Windows kind of started taking care of memory uh, but before that in DOS uh, even with you know the early Pentium and the 486 and we were all still using DOS we always had to worry about conventional memory because that's what programs accessed and it's the same with an 8088 machine so generally you have your memory and it's split and this is your conventional memory um, so the conventional memory is usually it maxes out at 640 uh, K, K of memory, and then this upper part is the rest. Uh, for I don't know what that adds up to, 300 and something to equal one megabyte. Now this is your upper memory, and this is restricted, and you really can't access this. And this is for stuff like uh, this is kind of reserved, and this is where you know like your BIOS is, and I mean, not the BIOS itself, but like information to control the BIOS and I.O. inputs and outputs and like if you have something like a hard drive and stuff like that. And it's kind of sectioned off into different like memory addresses. And usually you can't really access that, but that's basically what this, this is up here. Uh, but right here, this is what games use. They, they want to use this conventional memory space. So that's just the basic view of... Uh, the memory max in an 8088. All right, so here is the high card. Um, as you can see, it is the high card, and this is a very interesting card. Um, I guess you might find some use for this in an 8088 machine. I, I mean, I just kind of randomly came across it on a forum for a good price, and I just kind of had to pick it up because I've never seen anything quite like it. But basically, this is for your memory. And uh, again, the technical side I'm a little bit weak on, so I don't know 100% how it works, but I can tell you what it does. Okay, so referring back to this chart to see what the high card does, what the high card basically does is it expands this conventional memory to 702. Okay, so it gives you more conventional memory to use. And I know, I believe the memory address 
One of these is for like a monochrome graphics adapter, which most people don't use. Um, so I think it does may do something with that to let you use more. Um, there are a couple other uh, 8088 and 8086 PCs later on, maybe even contemporary, that use tricks to get you more conventional memory by doing something with the video. So that's what the high card does. It also lets you access some of these sections. Uh, so well, let's say you don't have a hard drive, just for example. So that means part of this reserved memory space isn't being used. It doesn't have to be a hard drive. It could be something else. Um, with the high memory card, it lets you access that, and it lets you load things up into it, uh, like in later DOS versions. So let's say you're using, you can load something into a high memory. So if you have for whatever reason, like a CD-ROM drive and you have to have a driver for it and you usually you would load that into high memory uh, to save you on conventional memory. The high mem card lets you do that. So what it basically does is it gives you, first of all, it gives you more conventional memory to use. So instead of 640k of conventional memory, you can set this up so it gives you 704k of conventional memory. Now, Actually, that almost seems like it would be more useful on a later system where you have a lot of games that are eating up a lot of conventional memory and things like drivers for different things, like CD-ROM drives and stuff. Um, I find in an 8088 system, I'm not really eating a lot of that conventional memory, so having more doesn't really help me, although uh, I can see with like office applications that were eating up a lot of memory, that might have been a lot more useful. The other thing this can do is allow you to put things, I believe, in upper memory. Usually the restricted area of memory, if you have parts of that you're not using, uh, this card will let you access it, uh, which is very interesting. So you could, I believe this will let you load things into uh, high memory. That's kind of an interesting feature. Again, I don't know how useful it is on an 8088 because, um, well, I haven't found a need to load anything into high memory. Uh, the other thing, you can use it as a RAM drive. And a RAM drive basically is a non-permanent sort of hard drive. Uh, it works like a hard drive. It's really, really fast because it uses RAM, but once you cut power to it, uh, everything on it is gone. It, it's an interesting card. could be quite useful. I just have it installed because I have it, and I think it's kind of cool. A uh, little bit difficult to set up. Manual isn't too hard to find online, but uh, you have to use some special software, and you have to set up these switches right here. And you have to, you kind of have to look into your system's, um, you know, upper memory and what's being used and what's not, and look at memory addresses and all that. It's a little bit archaic and a little bit difficult to understand. Well, as for this card, is it that useful in your 8088 machine? Uh, no, I really wouldn't recommend uh, something like this. Again, if you come across it for a good price like I did, you have an interest in these kind of things, by all means, uh, but I wouldn't go out of your way. And that's going to go for the next card too, which we're going to look at here. Alright, and the last thing we're going to look at is this, this monster card here, and this is an EMS memory card. Now, these are a little expensive and hard to find. Usually they go for about $100. And um, what this does, it actually circumvents sort of the one megabyte memory limit of the 8088, and it lets you add more memory, known as expanded memory. All right, so finally let's talk about a uh, real quick illustration on what the uh, EMS card is doing. Now what the EMS card basically is doing is it allows you to sort of circumvent this one megabyte barrier. So my card, for instance, has two megabytes. So let's represent that up here. So two megabytes, and this is our uh, EMS. So basically how it's accessing this is it's taking a little piece of this reserved memory and it's using it as a window to see this. It looks here first and then it uses that and then it looks up into this memory and then it uses that and so it's kind of inefficient, and later on uh, that's changed, especially with uh, XMS memory and things like that. But yeah, it's, it's basically getting around this by using a piece of that uh, reserved memory area here as a window to view this greater piece of memory that's EMS memory. So it, it's slow, it's inefficient, but it does get around the one megabyte limit. Um, now, as you'll notice, my card is not fully populated. Uh, this card supports up to 8 megabytes of expanded memory, and I only have 2 megabytes. So, I also notice this little thing here. It's like a dummy socket. 
uh, I believe this is necessary to be in 8-bit mode. So if you take that out, I believe it goes into 16-bit mode. You'll notice this is a 16-bit card, ISA card, but it works uh, fine in an 8-bit slot in an 8-bit mode. And uh, with the proper software, uh, it will give you expanded memory. Now this is I believe this is an Intel Above card, It was this one's called, but uh, there's a lot of these type of cards. They run on the LIM standard, which I believe it was a conglomeration of a couple companies, uh, Lotus123, Microsoft, and Intel that came together to come up with this standard. And the reason was, uh, as I said, a lot of these 8088 machines in the early 80s were for businesses and office applications, and some of those spreadsheets can get really big and eat up a lot of memory, and so they had to find a way to get around that and add more memory and get past that limitation. Um, now the thing is, for a gaming machine, uh, this is basically useless. Now, there are some early games, there's some later games too, that do require EMS memory. Um, not to be confused with later XMS memory, which is kind of different. Um, but anyway, the thing is with that, again, as with VGA, uh, a lot of the games that require that EMS memory, they really don't run that well in an 8088, and you're just better off playing them on a 386 or maybe even a 286, uh, where you don't quite have the same memory issues. So, unless you're doing, like, a lot of business Lotus 123 spreadsheets on an 8088, um, this really isn't all that useful for gaming. Um, I, I just wanted one because I don't know why. <laughs> I guess maybe for the video, um, to tell you guys you don't need one. Uh, it, it is kind of cool. It is a cool feeling to have like more than a megabyte of memory in your 8088 build. So it, there is a coolness factor to it. But as far as gaming goes, it, it, it's not very useful. Uh, I don't recommend spending a hundred bucks on these. But maybe you come across one at a thrift or something for five or ten dollars. Yeah, definitely I'd recommend picking one up. Hell, even just to resell it for a reasonable price. Um, but um, for gaming, uh, yeah, I don't really recommend any of the sort of memory expanders or controllers. Unless you're doing some wacky, you know, super build. I've seen people take 8088 machines and just, like, pump them up to the limit, like supercharge them, and they're playing games that they really should never have been playing on an 8088 build. But again, that's a, that's more of like a, a fun project. If you're just making a more, more or less period build, um, I don't recommend them. All right, and here we go with the post screen, the machine booting up. I always like to show this, and here it is counting up to the 640 uh, KB of conventional memory here. Um, Excuse the bad camera work here. This is before I figure out a way to get the camera to shoot things head on. So uh, it's a little bit from an angle here, and the uh, focus is kind of cruddy, but it, it gets a little bit better uh, a little bit later here. But yeah, I just I always like to show this. There is my hard drive controller right there. Um, that's a, it's a really nice 8-bit uh, IDE controller. I really like that card. Um, I got that card. It was in that Epson machine, the EN1, I think, and. There's the memory uh, expanded memory manager card, the Intel card right there. Uh, that's loading the extra two megabytes of extended memory. And then that initializing right there, that's the high mem card. So that's uh, giving us a little bit of memory in that high memory space that's usually reserved and you can't access. So uh, not horribly useful on this machine, as I said, but there it is doing its thing. And there we have the C prompt to the hard drive. Okay, so the first game I actually wanted to show off is good old Wizardry, and um, I actually stole this footage. Uh, this is my own like stock footage that I actually took from an older video I did about how to play the Wizardry Collection and the Ultima Collection on period hardware. So um, this is Ultima, or not Ultima, sorry, this is Wizardry running on this uh, 8088 machine. I believe I do have the turbo button enabled. It helps a little bit, but yeah, this game runs great on this machine. Uh, as you can see, it's using the correct sort of CGA color palette, at least the one you want to use. Uh, I see a lot of times it, it defaults, uh, especially I guess on cards that aren't actual CGA cards, it'll default to that really ugly, that like magenta color and that real, I forget, it's like magenta and two other, it's just, it's hideous, like magenta and a weird green, and um, yeah, it's just really ugly. And I mean, I guess none of the CGA color palettes really look great, uh, but I think this one, the one that's like white and red, and black actually kind of looks, some games it actually looks pretty decent. Um, 
and it actually looks pretty uh, nice on wizardry here. Um, I forget, it's like, maybe it's not, it's like red, and maybe it is red and magenta or something. I don't know. I just know that the, the, <laughs> there's different color palettes, and um, the one that usually defaults is absolutely hideous. Yeah, this one has some blue, but yeah, this color palette looks great. Uh, but yeah, this game runs fine. So uh, now we're going to move on to some other games here. So next we're going to look at the original Leisure Suit Larry and Land of the Lound Lizard, Lizards. Lizards. Um, so, okay, so I'm editing this a little bit so we don't have to wait because uh, it does take a while to load this game up. Um, I'm playing this game off the 720KB floppy drive. Alright, so I'm currently running this game at the stock 4.77 megahertz, and it, it runs fine. Um, as you can see, it defaulted to Hercules mode, um, monochrome here. Uh, there is a CGA-ish mode, which I will see in a minute. Um, but this game runs fine. I mean, I really would recommend playing this game on something a little more powerful, uh, or something with EGA, definitely something with EGA, VGA graphic capabilities. Um, uh, VGA just to be able to do the EGA, but... Yeah, I mean, it it plays okay, a lot of slow loading, but that's really the disk drive, but yeah, um, I don't really like this the Hercules graphics mode, personally, uh, at least for this game, it just, there, there's just too much, I don't know, it could be my monitor, um, but, uh, it, it, although it is far better than the color mode, which I will show you in a minute, now if you go into the menu here, there's, you can access a color mode, and um, yeah. Yeah, the color mode is none too flattering. Um, I would definitely prefer the Hercules monochrome mode um, over this color mode. Uh, this is just a horribly hideous, um, horrible. Uh, <laughs> like I said, I think this game was really meant for yeah EGA graphics. Uh, I believe this is an EGA. I know they did a VGA uh, version later. I've never really played that one. I've only played this version, but. Uh, yeah, the color mode on uh, a CGA color adapter is um, hideous. I, I don't know if there's a way to adjust it, but I, I didn't see one. Ugh. Next we're going to look at Prince of Persia. It's running off a 720 KB floppy disk uh, from that floppy drive. And it actually uses the uh, Sound Blaster card we have in there. So we get some uh, ad-lib Sound Blaster action going on. And this game actually plays really well. I'm just I'm running this at the default speed, 4.77 megahertz. I'm not using turbo mode, and it feels like really good, like spot on. Um, now the colors I've noticed, uh, at least looking here as I'm editing it, and when I watched it earlier, the colors seem a little bit off, like purpley. Um, I think that's just the because it's the camera pointing at the screen. Maybe uh, they look just fine. They look perfect uh, actually on the CGA monitor. So if the colors look off. To you guys, that's not it. It's just the camera. Uh, but yeah, this game really fluid. Um, the sounds, it all works great through the through the Sound Blaster card. And this game just runs really well, at least as far as I played. I, I never get very far in this game. Um, of course, I've never really tried to. But yeah, very fluid. Works very well on this 8088 rig. Alright, so this is Striker. I always kind of showcase this game when I'm looking at older PCs, just because this seems to be one of those games that's really speed sensitive. Uh, it really wants a 4.77 MHz 8088. Now, it can tolerate a little bit of a speed bump like a V20. Um, I believe I remember trying it on that CPU and it ran fine, but as uh, so you'll see in a moment, even turbo mode on this machine just makes it run too fast. Um, but yeah, this is kind of a fun game. I'm not too good at it. Uh, it looks kind of like a helicopter ripoff of Scramble, I think. Did you even... No, you use a jet in Scramble. Um, but it's kind of like Scramble for the, the PC with a helicopter. But uh, yeah, it, it's one of those CGA games that just kind of speed sensitive. 
Um, so I'm gonna engage turbo mode here in a second and you'll you'll see what I mean just by engaging the turbo mode on this machine. All right, so here we go. Um, you'll actually be able to tell. Yep, yeah, if you if you were watching the scrolling speed, you probably would have noticed when I hit the turbo button. So, um, <laughs> oddly enough, I actually do better at this game in the turbo mode, but obviously it's playing faster than it should be. I mean, the gun is now a rapid fire machine gun, and the bombs are just you know, it's just carpet bombing the hell out of everything. But it's it's obviously playing a little bit too fast. Although I wouldn't say it's unplayable at this too fast speed. There's those guys like just sprinting for the helicopter. Sorry for those focus issues there, but um, yeah, it does play too. It's it's even if it is playable at the speed, it's not really how the game was intended. There, I have deturboed it. Okay, so just a really quick crude example of CGA color palettes. Um, this is the game Striker. It actually allows you to select two uh, of the color palettes from CGA, and this one is the magenta, cyan, white black sort of color scheme and this is generally considered to be the most hideous of the CGA color schemes but it also allows you to choose the other uh, possibly equally hideous color scheme of green red and yellow and black um, although I guess it depends um, yeah neither are really appealing but um, yeah at least you have an option There's Microsoft Flight Simulator 2.1, and it actually gives you a range of displays. I picked the RGB display, so we have, uh, it, that would be my CGA display with color. Uh, so we're going to pick PC keyboard, it's not a PC Junior, and um, I'm, I've never really messed around with this, so I just put it on demo mode, so it will kind of run itself. Uh, and this game runs decently. This is one of those games that definitely benefits from the turbo button uh, being pressed or engaged and we'll see that in a second but even on just the regular stock speed the 4.77 megahertz it's it seems to be playable if not a little bit uh, jerky um, I don't know if that's the word for it uh, but yeah it, it, but it does play it seems to play pretty okay alright here we are up in the air and um, I think we're over Chicago. Uh, it's like a post-apocalyptic Chicago that seems that all that's left standing is the Sears Tower. I'm guessing that's the Sears Tower. Um, is there another building in Chicago that kind of looks like that? Is the Hancock Building? Uh, anyway, I'm guessing that's the Sears Tower. I'm guessing this is Chicago. Uh, best I can guess. Except I don't really see any other buildings. Um, but, you know, this is 2.0 running on a... IBM compatible PC machine so I guess uh, they can only do so much with the cityscape so alright here we are passing the Sears Tower and I'm going to engage the turbo button in a second now so if you can tell it got a little bit noticeably smoother so yeah kicking in that turbo button just a few megahertz boost uh, does seem to help this game uh, look a lot smoother whereas before it seemed a little bit more um, jerky I guess is the word I think there's a better word for it but yeah it just it just plays a little smoother with the uh, turbo button engaged not that it wasn't playable before but a little better now all right now we're gonna take a look at Jeopardy Junior Edition and this is use a different kind of CGA palette the, the green red yellow which is also pretty hideous but I have to say in some games it does look better than that default weird magenta tealish uh, Alright, enough of that PC speaker sound, but yeah, this game actually looks uh, pretty decent. Um, I don't know why I put the name uh, Jimmy in there. I, it sounds like a kid's name. This is Jeopardy Jr., uh, so why not? Um, so, yeah, it's it, lo it looks like a Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> so this is what you would expect it to be. This is Jeopardy, uh, but I guess the questions are a little bit easier because they're the, it's the Junior Edition, but... Um, yeah, this is Jeopardy, Jeopardy Jr. I went to play Burger Time. Uh, it actually looked really weird to me and not what I was seeing like a lot of the images. Uh, and I actually had to double check this with the good people at Vintage Computer Forums to make sure 
my card was displaying correctly but um, what you're gonna see here the the CGA palette for this game uh, on a real CGA card this is how it's supposed to look uh, in my opinion it's kinda ugly actually the the default that looks what it looks like the cyan magenta one that you see on like a VGA card it actually to me looks a little bit better in this instance um, but yeah, this is how Burger Time's supposed to look. I just find the blue to be like the blue background just like a bit overwhelming for this game. Um, but yeah, this is like how it looks correctly on a uh, you know real CGA card. Now I wanted to take a look at some of those windmill software games that supposedly gave trouble on VGA cards, just so I could compare. Um, so the first one I wanted to look at was Starquake. And this is a game that actually, this is one of those games that changes the CJ color palette as you go to different screens, uh, just to mix things up a little bit. So it's a pretty neat little game. I also want to take a quick look at the game Digger, uh, just because this is another one that on this title screen or the high score screen, it, uh, I've been told it does give errors on v some VGA cars and cards and things like DOSBox. Alright, so now we're just going to try a couple of these same games, but we're going to try them on our Pentium 75 machine uh, on an LCD and running a VGA card. So the VGA card is the uh, Mach 64, the ATI Mach 64. Not really known for being the most compatible VGA card, uh, but it should give a general idea of how a VGA card uh, will does CGA, at least a later VGA card. So. Um, and on an LCD too. So uh, let's take a look at what happens here. Okay, we're just going to start by looking at Burger Time, and right off the bat, you could see the screen shifted a little bit. Um, so like part of it's cut off. Now usually, you, sometimes you can fix that if your monitor has like an auto adjust, or you can just adjust it through the menu. Um, so we're going to see what this looks like uh, through a VGA card emulating CGA. All right, so here we go, and there we go. Yeah, it's it's what we mostly, a lot of us think of when we think of CGA. It's that default palette. Um, in this case, like I said, I st I actually think this looks better than on a true uh, CGA card. I mean, it, you know, it's not as colorful, but I think in this case, um, I think that's a good thing. Now there is composite, and comp if you go through the color composite. Um, this game actually supports that mode and it looks really good, uh, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit more at the end of the video because I had some trouble with that uh, with this machine. But uh, I'll throw up an image. This is actually what it looks like if you play it through the uh, color composite, which, you know, using an RCA jack and a color composite monitor. Alright, so now running Starquake on this same computer. Um, the speed seems okay, but as you'll see, the it just sticks with the default color palette. There's no palette switching like on a real CGA card. Um, and the sound is off, at least for the intro. So here we are, and right off the bat you can tell it's not using, it's just using the default palette. And it just, it uses the default palette straight through uh, the game. I don't know of any way to correct this uh, issue, but this is a common issue when you're using a VGA card. So I wanted to try one more thing. Now remember way back I did a video on this guy and this is the 386SX16 from BSR and the cool thing about this machine is 
it had a built-in video chipset with the Eagle 2 chipset from Cirrus Logic, which is thought to be the best or one of the very best VGA chipsets for compatibility with CGA. Um, it's also a very slow chipset, but uh, but yeah, it's supposedly extremely compatible with CGA. But the thing is, I actually don't have hope that this is actually going to give us any different results than the Mach 64 did. And that's because of two reasons. Uh, one, a lot of these cards had a dip switch on them, and you could set it the card through switches to a CGA compatibility mode. Um, now, the card in this machine is sort of a weird OEM version, and it doesn't have a dip switch on it. And the second thing is there's usually software like a driver that you could use to also set the card to a CGA mode, which I could not find the drivers for the Eagle 2 chipset, um, although I'm pretty sure they do exist uh, because I've been reading in forums and stuff about them, but uh, cannot find them uh, anywhere. So this is just the card as it is in this machine on that same uh, Samsung LCD, but this is just kind of a quick test, but I really don't think we're going to get any kind of different results. So here's something unusual. Um, for some reason, when it's hooked up down there to the LCD, uh, when you boot up the machine, if you read the, the you know, the post screen, it says something about assuming monochrome, um, even though in the BIOS it's set for EGA, VGA. But when I just, all I simply did was unplug the LCD and hook it up to the CRT, and suddenly the color mode works again. Um, so, <laughs> I, that's very unusual. I do not know why that is happening. Um, why the um, LCD, it, when hooked up to an LCD, it will only display in mono. Um, but when hooked up to the CRT, uh, it does go into color mode. But as we can see here with Burger Time, uh, it is the same thing. It is the default palette. Uh, but just for, uh, you know, just for fun, let's try out uh, Starquake. <laughs> well, the sound is uh, certainly not correct, uh, but it, it actually, well, it's actually doing better than the Pentium, but now I can see that's definitely an issue with speed. And I still see this weird, looks like an eyeball that opens up here, um, but it's much slower than before, so you can actually kind of make out that it's something else. Wow. Um, but yeah, we still have the same issue with the default CGA palette and um, not changing. And um, actually this is Digger. Uh, I just tried running Digger and uh, I knew there was some kind of issue that came up with this game on a VGA card on the um, intro screen. And um, yeah, it's really weird. Uh, like I said, there might be a way to correct this, uh, but just booting up the game, this is what you get, or at least that's what I got. Um, let me see if I can get through this and see if the game itself runs okay. Um, no, it doesn't. Wow, it's really fast too, way too fast. So as this video is wrapping up and I'm wrapping up shooting the elements for it, I did realize that I haven't shown you guys uh, any games via the composite uh, color output. And the reason for that is I just can't seem to get it to work even though I am sure this card is a hundred percent capable of outputting color composite. Um, I actually even replaced this card, obviously this is out of the machine now, but I actually had another one of these, a version 1, that is pretty much the same um, with the same capabilities and I installed that and I still uh, cannot get it to output color composite. It's outputting monochrome composite, but I can't get it to output a uh, color composite signal. Um, so, obviously something's configured wrong. Uh, I've tried a lot of settings with the uh, switch here. You can't see it well on this one because, but you can configure with that switch. Um, I've asked the good people over at the Vintage Computer Forums and they didn't know either what the issue could be, so um, we're just going to have to save that for another video. I have another machine with a um, CGA card uh, that I know the color composite out works. And I'll just show that in that video. Uh, in the meantime, again, check out 8-Bit Guy's video on CGA 
because he also goes over um, color composite and it's it's a pretty good explanation he has some pretty good examples so again I urge you to watch that video if you want to learn more about CGA and color composite output so in conclusion what do I think about an 8088 based machine should you build one of these machines or pick one up uh, if you come across one well as usual, uh, the answer to that kind of varies. Uh, of course, I think if you find one for something like five or ten dollars, even twenty dollars, uh, of course, pick one up. But you know, do should you go out of your way or spend a lot of money on uh, like an 8088 based machine? Uh, if you're just like a casual user, uh, you're just getting into maybe retro computing. Uh, I really have to say no. I, I think when a lot of people sort of want to get into retro computing or they think about retro gaming on old computers and stuff I think they're thinking more of like a a golden age and I think people are more drawn to this the sort of VGA era uh, that's kinda of more akin to like the 386 or the 486 I think when people think about playing classic computer games they they think more about like Doom or uh, Duke Nukem or Wolfenstein 3D even uh, games of that nature uh, even maybe like Fallout, the first one, I think there was a DOS version of it. So, games like that, even stuff like Eye of the Beholder. Um, and this, the NATO 88 machine, it really has not much in common with that era. It's just, it, it's just not powerful enough to run a lot of games from that era. Um, I, I think the games, this, remember, when these things first came out, uh, the, like earlier computers, they were more thought of as business machines. There wasn't necessarily an emphasis on video games or gaming on them so a lot of the games were a lot simpler too you just have a lot of these kind of pick up and play sort of arcadey games now of course like we have here we do have some simulation uh, games mostly like military simulations and stuff like that but um, even had some in-depth RPGs that will work pretty well on an 8088 uh, maybe like the first Ultima uh, even Ultima 1 and 2 and um, stuff like Wizardry will work fine on an 8088 but I just, I, I do think when people think of retro computing, they think of a different era. And I think a 386 or a 46 would really uh, suit the, that era more. Even when you think about like EGA point and click adventure games or uh, even parser uh, based games, uh, that's really more suited for like a 286 or a 386. So you're just a little bit more limited with an 8088. And I really think it's, it's met for more of like you know, simpler CGA type games so um, that's why I'd say for like a casual user someone just getting into retro computing I really wouldn't recommend an 8088 based machine it's just a little bit more limiting and the games are really more arcadey sort of pick up and uh, pick up and play for a little bit you got a lot more like text based games and stuff so that's just my opinion of course if you're interested in these really early type games yeah I don't want to discourage you um, it's a little bit archaic, so it's a little bit harder to, to get into. Uh, it's a little bit harder to find some of these parts, especially like 8-bit expansion cards uh, for those 8-bit ISA slots. Uh, but, you know, I don't want to discourage you. If you it, it is, it's a very rewarding experience to put together an old 8088 machine. Um, so, you know, if that's really what you want to go for, go for it. But, like I said, for the main mainstream sort of people getting into retro computing, uh, I would really suggest you go for like a Socket 7 machine first or like a 46, 386. I think you'll get a lot more use out of uh, that era retro computer. So, yeah, that was my look at uh, what I think makes a really good 8088. We looked at some parts that are very useful. Looked at some parts that you really don't need at all. But, you know, if you want that feeling of a really sort of powerful 808, 8088, uh, well, now you have some insight on some parts you might want to pick up. Um, so, hope you enjoyed the video. I know this one's been a long time coming, so uh, what we're going to go do next, I uh, might be wondering what's in store now for this Anatomy of series. So, when I started this series, uh, we started with sort of late DOS. So, we looked at a Socket 7 machine and uh, a fast Pentium uh, build. Uh, for DOS. And we also looked at like what I would call a Windows 3.1 sort of machine. We looked at a fast 486 uh, with PCI slots and stuff. So um, now that we've gone all the way back as far as x86's go 
and uh, at least as far as gaming and whatnot on these types of machines. Uh, we're going to switch gears now and we're going to head forward again. So we're going to start delving into the Wintel era. And uh, it seems like the era after DOS, instead of being defined by CPUs as like the 386 era or 486, it started kind of being defined a little bit more by operating systems. So what's coming up next? The next video in this series will be the Windows 95 uh, anatomy of a Windows 95 machine. So, kind of a, it's a very, very interesting machine I put together uh, with period parts. It's kind of from 95 to very early 98 before Windows 98 came out. And uh, it's, it's interesting. It's going to be a good video. And then we're going to do, uh, I have two Windows 98 machines I'm going to look at, and then we'll finish it up with a uh, Anatomy of Windows XP machine, which is a very late era XP machine. I have other videos in the works with XP era machines, but it's not what I would, you know, it's not something that I would consider. The Anatomy of w w machine is more like it encompasses all of the XP era, uh, sort of the ultimate XP machine. So I uh, hope you look forward to that. I'm looking forward to doing those videos and, of course, writing the blog entries too. So thanks again for joining me with this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Thanks again, guys. If you like this kind of content, please subscribe, and uh, I'll see you later.